Hello, I'm Paul Ogden, and you're listening to And He Takes That Chance. Keeps it in play, holds off and Bemba, releases Payne in space. Payne's got a chance. Yes. Payne scores! Jack Payne scores! Loader! Oh, has got options. Chunga plays it into the box. Well, 2-1 for us. Infield, he's got Moy. Moy can still hit one anyway. Deflection, Hagelhoff, 2-1 on the field town. Michael Hagelhoff, the cult hero, takes advantage of a deflection. Brain the moment on the field town because a German has won the West Yorkshire Derby. Four three challenge chance for a sherry. Danny Ward saves. Danny Ward saves. German defender Christopher Schindler has unbearable responsibility on his shoulders. Right for it, Schindler! He scores the goal! The fires on his field into the Premier League. A switch quickly in field to Moy again, and Moy's looking in the penalty area. One, two, wicket jumper. Here's Moy, right for it! 1 0 on his field town! A goal of fabulous pump! Quality. Inch with a repeat corner from the right. Left footed, near post. Schindler flicks it. 1 0 on a field town. Twist of the Schindler has met Tom Inch this corner. Inch might have taken another deflection, but Town's talisman defender has broken Manchester's defence. The pass was in there. Here's Sanchez to turn it into the pass. Yeah. Welcome to another summer special episode of the Andy Takes That Chance podcast. Today, Neil and myself, Matt, are joined by one of the best in the football commentating business. It's the orator supreme, Paul Ogden. Wow. That's <laughs> what you call putting pressure on a bloke, now, isn't it? Well done. I'm sweating already. <laughs> Good morning, Oggy. Morning. So, Oggy, do we call you Paul? Do we call you Oggy? You call me Oggy. Call Even you Oggy. Calls me that now. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get into being the Huddersfield Town commentator on Radio Leeds? Because I remember back, you know, you've got stories from the Steve Bruce days. Mm. Um, I also have a bone to pick with you because you once interviewed me for TV outside the Huddersfield Town ground prior to the Millennium Stadium oh, yeah. game at Cardiff, and it was never used on TV. Really? And I, I thought I delivered a cracking. You blame me for that? <laughs> let me give you let me give you Harry Gration's home address because <laughs> it will have been his decision not we'll, to use. We'll get that Harry one. on later. Um, Adam Pope seemed to be on commentary then. Whereabouts did yeah. you... I remember you very clearly from Stan Turner and Jacko, yes. I think, before yeah. that. Whereabouts did you... How did I get into it? Step in, because obviously me and Neil are usually at the game, so yeah. listening's not always not always wow. a possibility. Where did you spring from, Oggy? 
Well, I'll give you the short version. Um, I, I started at Radio Leeds in the late 90s, 96, 97, as, a, as an occasional broadcaster. Yeah. Uh, but that was on Rugby League, actually, because my football commentary then was done at the radio station I worked for before I came to Radio Leeds, which is BBC Radio Lancashire. Right. Um, I didn't get my permanent job at Radio Leeds till 99. And ever since then, I've mostly been the Huddersfield Town commentator and still very flattered and very pressured and honoured to yeah. be selected as Huddersfield Town commentator. How I got into the whole business goes back a lot further than that because I, I didn't get into it by the academic route, studying journalism. A lot of extremely laudable colleagues, I'd say the majority of these days, study journalism or, or media in some form. I did a different degree and I trained on the job as a newspaper reporter. Right. Um, and that was when I lived in London. Uh, I mean, you could even twist it as far back as writing from a university newspaper, writing a letter to my local paper in the 80s because I'd caught the rugby reporter in a half-truth hmm. and I questioned it. That's probably when it started, but I start, basically started off in newspapers as a match reporter. Nice. I did a lot more rugby at the beginning of my career than I've done for a long time now. Uh, my first competitive Huddersfield Town match as a reporter, I only did bits of commentary, was a cup tie at Wrexham. An FA cup tie at Wrexham and Ian Rush was playing. We drew and we beat him in the replay here. That's I remember that. That was, that was at Wrexham. Yeah, yeah yes. it was um, shocking. It was in a shocking state because they were reconstructing the ground. Mm. And I think one of the town players had a bad injury that day. Was it, it could have been Tommy Cowan or Steve Jenkins, somebody like that. It was before Peter Jackson lost his job and was replaced by Steve Bruce. Mm. Um, there's, there's one... Tell me when to stop, Matt, because this is detail. Okay, go. There's something that I need to explain at the very outset. Uh, and this has never changed in the nine, 18, 19 years I've been on the staff at BBC Yorkshire. Being the Huddersfield Town commentator is only part of my job. If there's ever a job advertised as nothing but Huddersfield Town correspondent, including commentary, you'll see some very familiar applicants for it. Uh, but there's never, that kind of job has never existed yeah. uh, at our place. It did briefly when Leeds United were in the Champions League yeah. for a Leeds United correspondent, and that still to some extent exists now. But a, a local BBC level, um, usually covering a football team, is part of a staff job. Mm. And that is something I've held all the time you've been listening to me on the radio. Yeah. So there have been periods when I didn't cover midweek matches because I was diversifying into certain television skills um, but for the most of that 18 19 years I've flatteringly and I mean that yeah. been selected as, as Huddersfield Town commentator well you are, you are the voice to us you are the voice of Huddersfield Town you are instantly linked and your voice it's I was sat in the studio when we did a thing with Johnny a while back and now the studios have changed now where they come and do the the news sat next to you actually in the mm. studio don't they and Clive Settle came in and sat next to me. Yeah. And oh, he is a legend, by you, the way. You know this voice, and yeah. all of a sudden, he's there. Yeah. And then, oh, I know that voice. On a what human voice. level, it's quite, it's quite disconcerting yeah. to see the voice, the sound that you're familiar yeah. with, coming out of a face yeah. that you'd maybe visualise yeah, in a yeah. different way. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's human nature. Yeah, it is. And uh, it's, it's the sum of many parts. Yeah. That is my workplace, and perhaps also the people that work in it. Forestieri, saved by Danny Ward. Huddersfield Town, the annual strugglers who've become Premier League dreamers, are defying the odds again. The dream is on. So what kind of preparation goes on for the commentary? So we'll focus mostly on the Huddersfield Town commentary that you do what what preparation goes on before a game that we, we want we recently had Bobby Madley on and we were a bit yeah. surprised at the prep that goes on I've listened to Sam Matterface on TalkSport before not that I listen to TalkSport too much never but, heard of him sorry <laughs> but he was um he, he detailed some of the stuff that he does before and it was quite mm. impressive of what he does what kind of you've invited me here to Uncover my trade secrets, man. <laughs> this is it, yeah. Oh, well, I'm just going to walk out. <laughs> this is door. part one of the usurpation. <laughs> well, <part local. laughs> the, um, I can't speak for other commentators, and I mean that. Uh, I can only do things my way, and, yeah. and your technique evolves over the years. The first thing I would say in answer to your question, Matt, is Sam Matterface is another very versatile human being. Mm. 
and professional broadcaster. Yeah. And he does, to my knowledge, radio commentary and television commentary. He does, yeah. Two completely different skills. Mm. Completely different skills. And if you want me to talk for an hour on that, I can. <laughs> I promise you I'm not going to today. What kind of preparation goes into my commentaries, me being a pure radio commentator? Yeah. Um, you'll kill me for boring you if I went throughout the course of a week. But during the season, from week to week, preparation for a commentary... And again, I'm only speaking about myself. I'm not speaking about my colleagues or, or, or other commentators. Preparation is, is a rolling agenda of training your brain to, well, inform the audience, recognise the players in one go, because yeah. I can promise you, in live radio commentary, you get one chance. Yeah. And mm -hmm. if you get it wrong, thousands yeah. and thousands of people will know very quickly that you've got it wrong. And I can yeah. tell you a story about that. This is why me and Neil very relevant. replace. Yeah. <laughs> very relevant to town fans. Um, we're in the business as radio, live radio commentators of depicting an event as it happens. And the older I get, the more difficult I find it. Yeah. Experience doesn't help at all because experience drives you to try and be better in the face of a million people who also want to be radio commentators. Yeah. I think there are 10,000 in Huddersfield alone who yeah. just want to replace me. <laughs> and I don't sure blame them. Because it's, it's a very... Um, it won't go down well. It's a very exciting and stimulating way to earn your living. But without giving too many trade secrets away, you've got to train your brain to recognise all those professional athletes moving very quickly, especially in the Premier League. Yeah. And in very unusual ways, they move. And you've got one go to do it. And if you want to inform the audience more about those individuals, then you need some preparation time. And actually, there's probably a hidden aspect to it as well, which I'm quite big on, especially the older I get, which is this. Consider this, ladies and gentlemen. Your radio show goes on effectively at about quarter past one on a Saturday afternoon because you've got to rig all the gear up first. Yeah. And in my case, certainly in our case at BBC Radio Leeds, you, you, you're going to do a lot of chasing around before you even go on air and get the team news and all the rest of it. Yeah. You, your workday starts about half 12, really. And it finishes at about half past six. Try and go that period without eating yeah. when you're talking incessantly and running around. So you need to make sure you're prepared physically, yeah. is what I'm saying. You need to eat properly. A good night's kip is ideal as well, if you yeah. possibly can, although with kids in the house, that's increasingly mm -hmm. difficult. Uh, all these things, all these pieces of the jigsaw go into a match commentary. Yeah. And some are better than others at it. And I have bad days as well, mm. as good days. And, oh, all right, let's give you an example. You remember Peter Jackson's glorious promotion season in League Two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had an obscure fixture, which you guys will remember, at York City's Bootham Crescent. Mm. I say obscure because I think I'm right in saying it was played on a Sunday. It was, yeah. And the town fans made a magnificent noise as usual in that open end of Bootham Crescent on the terrace that's yeah. got no roof on it. And town, it was, this is a League Two fixture that ended up with that promotion at Cardiff. And that was a period of our lives when town had two players that I, even after quite a few years' experience, had real trouble distinguishing between. You've got to identify these players. Opposition players are usually more difficult than your own. Yeah. But town had two players with the exact same physique and the exact same nearly shoulder length hair. Danny Schofield yeah. and Andy Holdsworth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So. And we struggled against York. You'll remember it as the day that David Murphy announced himself. Yeah, he came yeah, on yeah. with a magnificent yeah. cameo as a sub. And I think he scored the second goal. Yeah. But the first goal was scored by Danny Schofield yeah, well, yeah. after a rebound. Kids, imagine this. We didn't have the internet in those days. There was no collective source of information in the press box or anywhere else. If I make a mistake on air now, yeah. my hate mail inbox fills up on Twitter straight away. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what are you talking about? Yeah. The usual thing. That's Twitter language, by the way. <laughs> At York City that day, we didn't even have the internet. My co-commentator that day was perhaps not quite on the ball as he should have done. And I called our scorer of that first goal, Andy Holdsworth because he looked exactly the same as Danny Schofield, especially yeah. on a murky day at Bootham Crescent yeah, yeah, in the yeah. silent rain. And I was about to leave that stadium after the match had finished 
completely unaware that I'd misidentified the ident- yeah, misidentified score, Town's yeah. first goal scorer because there was nowhere else to go. There was yeah. nowhere. My co-commentator, whose name you'll be able to guess, Matt Glennon's predecessor, didn't nudge me because he didn't know any better. Yeah. We both knew it was David Murphy for the second goal because that yeah. was a glorious event. But in the melee and the, the scramble for the rebound, I had no idea that I'd misidentified the guy. And I was about literally to leave the stadium and go home ignorant of, of what was actually a howler, a howler Until of a mistake. Until Sunday papers tell you you've got it wrong. Correct. Yeah. You know? And actually it was somebody who was listening to my post-match report elsewhere in the press box. Probably didn't watch town routinely. I didn't recognise him. And he said, excuse me, my good man. Did you say it was Holdsworth who scored Huddersfield's first goal? I thought it was Schofield or something like that. And that's how life was before the internet. And that's how hazardous it is being a live yeah. radio commentator. Yeah. Less so these days, because as I said, yeah, it's all instant 10,000 people will tell you wrong now straight away. Yeah. Um, but then <clears throat> life was a bit different. Yeah. Mm. I'm not quite sure if I can say the name, but um, goats are the salt in the soup. You know, if the, if the soup is tasty, there has to be salt sometimes in it, yeah? And without a goal, you can't win the game. So, uh, we're trying to uh, be good chefs. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll move on to life in general. And one person you spend a lot of time, well, not a lot of time, well, a fair amount of time with on a Saturday and maybe on a Thursday, if you go to the presser, is the town manager. Mm. So, you've you've dealt with several different managers over the course of the years there's um, you can come in with some that I might have missed here but there's Peter Jackson there's Andy Ritchie Jerry Murphy Graham Mitchell Stan Turnant Lee Clark Simon Grayson Mike Robbins Chris Powell David Wagner and Jan Zivert Mick Wadsworth and Mick Wadsworth and Mark Hudson and Mark Hudson for a day we'll we'll try to forget about Mick Wadsworth that's best forgotten I think that season well he's a real gentleman and and he was working in difficult circumstances he was you know uh, I, I could tell you a tale about each one, but you carry on, Matt. I don't want to interrupt you. No. So, how is it? How, who's who? Well, obviously, who's your favourite that you've dealt with? But how is it? How do each one differ, and how does mm. your approach tailor to each one as well? Because mm. obviously, I remember Stan Turner and, and Lee Clark in particular being a little bit fiery if things haven't got gone Correct. quite well. Yeah, both quite spiky, aren't they? Whereas Dave, right. you know, and, and I remember Lee Clark having a having a go at you once as well yeah. on radio, and you took it really well, and you just kind of went. Hazard of the job, you know, absolutely, kind of, is. absolutely fine. And on the other side, on the other side, you've got David Wagner, who, if things have gone wrong, he will take time to explain in detail what went well, what didn't go well, yeah. and be quite ambivalent, almost in, mm. in a way that he would just go, "Yep, yeah, we didn't deserve to win. We got what we deserved, etc." Who, how has it been dealing with these characters, if you like, and what characters in particular stand out <laughs> over the years? The post-match interview. Mm. is one of the most important parts of match day. Yeah. And the reason for that is it is so hungrily consumed by people who've seen the match for themselves. Yeah. In the modern day era where every single decision by referees, but also by managers that select the team, by the players on the field, every single thing is scrutinised yeah. to the nth degree. The post-match interview... I actually think has probably become more important than it really should be because the managers themselves have morphed into politicians, mm. some more than others. Rafa. But as representatives <laughs> of their brand, yeah. they are thrust forward. Um, I must say I'm quite critical about post-match interviewing skills, my own included. Uh, I'm, and at local radio level, it's a little bit of a tricky balance between trying to quiz a manager on why this has happened and why that has happened but at the same time maintain what should be a quite intimate relationship with them yeah because you need that contact throughout the week don't you Not just ideally the- although uh, if, if a manager refuses to speak to me or any other local radio journalist that they speak to routinely it's probably for good reasons because you've just quizzed them Paxman style yeah. and possibly even found out something that you shouldn't yeah. that does happen yeah. and that's happened with the names that you've mentioned already Matt in that little list that you gave us there it's a very important part of the job. Um, I should say this to you. I've dealt with Stan Turner twice in my career because I dealt with him when he was Burnley manager. A fantastic grounding for somebody who was just coming into the trade. Yeah. I mean, I was in my 30s then. I came to it quite late. But it was still 
uh, talking to an audience very similar to the Huddersfield Town audience, the Burnley audience. The, for, for me, they're similar towns. Yeah. Similar hunger. Yeah. Um, very similar com- over scrutiny of everything that happens at the football team for all the right reasons. Yeah. Uh, so it was helpful when Stan Turner, to all our surprise, got the Huddersfield Town manager's job that I'd actually dealt with him before mm-hmm. in ridiculously difficult circumstances when he was Burnley manager. Um, but uh, it's a tricky business, Matt. There's all sorts I could say about the the post-match interview. It's a tricky business for one really big reason, and that is that after you've finished a full match commentary, if you've done it properly, you're you're a wreck. The last thing you want to do is have a carefully scrutinised conversation with somebody live on air. Um, And again, I'm not speaking for other broadcasters, but I I usually need um, a a strong cup of tea, to say the least, after I've finished a match commentary in any circumstances. Um... Lee Clark was, was was feisty generally if things had gone wrong. I don't blame him for that. I really don't because he was very exacting of himself. Yeah. My job is not to be the manager's best mate when I interview them afterwards. And they know jo- that as well. They should do. Yeah. Some of them forget it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Some of them do. Yeah. And, um, and some of them have to be reminded by their own head of communications. Yeah. But here's the trick. Uh, and it's really a coincidence in my job that sometimes the feistiest managers with the rudest answers to my post-match questions are accidentally making some glorious radio mm. as they're being rude to me. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think I'm talking about Stan Turnan, who's got a, a very warm human side to him. Yeah and who I particularly sympathise with these days because he's had some horrible yeah, tragedies to deal yeah, with in his yeah. personal life. Believe it or not, Stan Turner helped me in the early days of my career when I was at BBC Lancashire. Uh, and I can explain why if you need me to. But going back to the point, um, during the era when Stan Turner was briefly Huddersfield Town Manager, a lady came up to me on the train and she said, excuse me, you don't know me. You're Paul, aren't you? you I think I listened to you on the radio. I said, that's an interesting thing to say. You think you listen to me on the radio. (laughs) She says, well, I'm not into football at all. But my husband, he loves you and he loves your radio station and he loves Huddersfield Town. Um, She says, but recently at five o'clock every Saturday, I've been tuning in and I, I, I move everything and I stop what I'm doing and I listen. I can't remember his name. Who is that man who keeps being rude to you after the matches? <laughs> and she started to listen because, like everybody, nobody knew what, what Stan was going to say next. No. You yeah, know, well, those canon for interviews. Well. Was he going to talk about his Christmas dinner on uh, yeah. whether it was Carlisle or Christmas yeah, yeah. dinner? You know, the famous old anecdote. Yeah. But you see, the thing is, Stan Turner himself, like Lee Clark, like Mick Wadsworth, Peter Jackson, for different reasons along the line, they've all struggled to do their job well yeah. in certain circumstances. Yeah. And sometimes they can only prepare the players in the way they, th- they think fit and send them over the white line. It's not like FIFA, kids, where you actually control the players' movements yeah. and you can beat yourself up yeah. for them getting things wrong. The players themselves are human beings and some of them, frankly, are less reliable than others. But the post-match interview has got to investigate all that and still to, to this day, and it'll continue next season, when Jan Zivert has his difficult moments, and I'm yeah. sure he will yeah. at times. I hope it's not many, but I'm sure yeah. he will. It's a difficult league, the Championship. Absolutely. Yeah. But those post-match conversations will be a very important part of it's our it's Saturday f- outcome. Five o'clock is probably the, the dreaded hour for managers because it's, it is very emotive. It is, they're coming straight off the back of a win, a defeat, some, you know, a bad decision, a great decision, controversial stuff, and they've got to be sensible and watch what they're saying to an extent, some but of them that's don't still think your that, job to well, some of them don't dig think in there. And, and the other thing I will say in sympathy for all managers post-match is that they're a mess as well because they're yeah, shattered. The adrenaline has only just yeah. stopped flowing. Yeah. They're probably seething about certain managerial, yeah. uh, sorry, refereeing decisions. And um, probably the last person they want to see is, you. is good yeah. old Oggy with a mic yeah, with a or whoever yeah. it is that's interviewing yeah. them afterwards. Mm. It's, it's not easy for them to do either. The thing is as well, you've got, because of the nature of when it is, most people have got back to the car, so your listening figures have probably gone up at five o'clock. 
because a lot of people have got back in the car, they're listening to it going home because they've all been sat in ground watching it. Are you suggesting, my friend, that nobody listens to the match <laughs> commentaries anymore? Just the ones that are in the ground. <laughs> are you telling me that the Are you telling me that the illegal web streams don't have post match interviews of their own? Oh, I try to get a signal in that football ground if without Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah, no chance, have you? It is Especially with twenty thousand now, it was easy when Chris. Paul well, you was do what you, you get in the car, and, you, and by the time you, you hope it's been on, by the time you've got home, because that's your ears doing it's a it backs you up. Yeah, radio. Most managers take a long time. In the Premier League, it was a nightmare because. <laughs> This even surprised me. The Premier League culture on a match day is very regimented. Yeah, they And I must say, we had to wait very patiently for some of our post-match interviews yeah. because they, they had to speak to German television, uh, in our case, Danish television, in yeah, the players' yeah. case, uh, and all the rest of it, yeah. to say nothing of the, the actual host broadcasters. Mm. But it's often worth waiting for, and should be, if we're doing our jobs properly. Yeah, definitely. But um, we can go right through the... the the scope of, of the managers that I've dealt with only at Huddersfield Town. But um, Peter Jackson, in a different positive way, w- is always very emotional post-match yeah. because he's that kind of guy. Yeah. And I love him. I think we all do for that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. raw in his honesty yeah. sometimes. Um, Lee Clark would be the first to admit, if you sat him down here, yeah. that he perhaps struggled with the emotional side yeah. of match day sometimes, even though we had that magnificent unbeaten run. Yeah. When it started to come to an end, and Lee Clark's not daft, by the way, he's a vastly experienced footballer, even before he came to Huddersfield yeah. Town as manager for his first big job as, as a manager anywhere. But he could read the signs that he was under immense pressure. And when we got beat by Sheffield United that night at home, that signalled the end, um, he'd seen the signs way before that. Yeah. And I think his post-match interviews reflected that in the run-up yeah. to that particular match. Yeah, yeah. Mick Wadsworth, a real gentleman, and a real student of football overseas and, and locally. I've seen him recently at Sheffield United's Academy. Mm-hmm. Um, he was so exasperated at the uh, circumstances under which he had to work, pre and post administration, yeah. before he was sacked by the administrator. It I think was it nigh on impossible, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, uh, and, and his body language and the tone of his post-match interviews reflected that, yeah. which made it a difficult lesson for us as fans. Yeah. But they all have certain circumstances to deal with. I was going to say, you kind of mentioned one or two there, and um, any favourite particular quotes that stand out as, as your favourite? I, I did have two Stan Turner ones where you took the Christmas dinner one, and the other one of my other favourite one was after a performance where we hadn't played particularly well, he accused, um, well not accused, but said Huddersfield, fa- Huddersfield Town fans expect champagne taste some beer money, which mm. I think is used before, mm. which... He may have had a point to a certain extent. I thought mm. I don't think we'd ever spent any money before two thousand eight. Adrian Dean Hoyle had just come along and we got a few players, mm. and, but they still weren't obviously Premier League. Apart from Gary Roberts, I don't think any of them were particularly top class, were they? But and he brought him in, by the way. He, he did. did yeah. It's a great signing. Um, any favourite quotes? Anything that stands out? That's difficult off the top of my head, Matt. I must say. Um, oh. I mean, Lee Clark in the interview that you referred to earlier, he t- he said. Um, uh, you see, he'd been eavesdropping on my post-match report that we used to do in those days. And he was standing there sniggering at it, basically, at Rochdale, I seem to remember. All right. And, remember. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, three and he just came up, and when I did the post-match interview, he, he, he started his answer completely irrelevant to what I'd asked him. Yeah. But he started his answer just by doing an appraisal, basically, of my own post-match report <laughs> yeah. and how the reason I was a commentator is because I never could have been a footballer if that, that was how badly I understood oh, football. But... I, honestly, it sounds like I'm being soppy here, but I, I can stomach that and I don't begrudge Lee Clark or anybody the opportunity to let all that out because no. he's the manager of our football team. Absolutely, yeah. And even me as a comer inner to Huddersfield as a place to live, you know, I've, I've fallen in love with the, the team and the town over the years and it, it means a lot to me that our football team means that much yeah. to a bloke with that kind of experience. And let's um, be fair, it's radio gold, stuff like that. As I was is, saying before. It is radio gold. People who are not town fans will enjoy that as a piece of radio. Yeah. I mean, there must be times when something controversial in a game, especially if it's happened late, you're almost rubbing your hands ready for post-match interview because you know there's got to be something in there. That's... <laughs> well, it's part of my job, Nick. I've yeah, got no absolute, choice. To, no, absolutely. I've got no choice. I have to do it anyway. But that's why we want to listen yeah. because that makes it an interesting listen for us and you, you are yeah. waiting for that particular yeah. sort of soundbite if you like yeah. it's, uh, I, I, I've I, got a little bit of um, a bugbear there which is a very personal thing but 
I must say, I get very bored very quickly. Might be a sign of old age. <laughs> very bored very quickly. Going back through refereeing decisions that haven't got, gone our way. Yeah, yeah. And one thing we do love at town is to blame the ref. Yeah, we do. We stopped doing it after about 10 matches in that second Premier League season because no clearly point, was the ref was <laughs> yeah. not really, no. <laughs> wasn't really our most fundamental problem. We no. just weren't that competitive. Um, but it's very rare that we leave a stadium, and I've been like this all my life since I was a little boy, you very rarely leave the stadium and say, mind you, the ref had a good game today. No. You know, I think you know, it's just one we of did the... it once, didn't we? I think once. this season, yeah. In how many shows matches? You how many times. But we were already relegated, yeah. so it, it, the, the game no longer mattered. Yeah, it and, sort of pressure uh, off a bit. And we'd lost 4-1 to Leicester, and it was it David Coote? Yeah. The guy? And yeah. we came away from there, didn't we, after and said, the referee was all right, wasn't he? Yeah. Even though he gave us a penalty, which never was, which yeah. probably meant why he was all right. But... Uh, it was our only penalty last season, guys. <laughs> yeah. Let's yeah. count our blessings. It's, it's funny how when the pressure's off and the games don't matter so much that you look at things in a completely different light mm. as well. And... and every single one of you should never forget it doesn't count how big you are it doesn't count how experienced you are it doesn't count how nice you are if you have passion desire you have no limits no limits a light I want to look at with Oggy's that sounds wrong doesn't it Oggy's light on this well, but if I can shed any to <laughs> my favourite up until recently my favourite football season as I just feel town fan was the Warner Corn 94-95 that 12 months where yeah. I went to Wembley twice that was amazing um, but that got beaten mm. easily comprehensively in 2016-17 uh, with David Wagner's side and promotion yeah. at Wembley you were the narrator mm. if you like of that amazing story which we all, we all feel is an amazing story which the football club don't always get enough credit for outside of West Yorkshire mm. it must hold quite a lot of amazing memories for you as well as as the person who was there every week living yeah. it breathing it on a Saturday I know you mm. do other things outside of it but mm. living that side of the football and there were so many colourful characters that dropped in dropped out hair fuller yeah uh, and then on the other side, you've got... He was such a cornerstone of the team, you know, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. off the field as much as on yeah. it. Yeah, and then you've got the polar opposite almost in Chris Lerber, who's Mr. Angry, very serious. But an important player. But a very great guy great as well. I'm quite sorry he's gone, by the way. Absolutely. Yes, I think we are. But I, I understand why. It's yeah. personal reasons and all the rest of it. He was quite grouchy last season, Chris. Yeah. He'd be the first to admit it if you sat him down here. Yeah. He was one of the ones who uh, was was one of the first to... to refused to accept the low standards that the team were putting out. Yeah. He was so upset after the game at Bristol City when we got knocked out of the cup. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm digressing here, I apologise, Matt. But they, they're all really important parts of the emotion of, of yeah. what the team has delivered over the last couple of years. Chris, Chris Lerbo missed a 7 out of 10 money, always. I see Usually. Yeah. Yeah. Usually. I, I see Just a future a manager there, I think, in yeah. Chris Lerbo. Is, uh, Are you going to ask me what my favourite season has been all these years, Matt? I, I think the way you've I, said I really that may surprise that. me, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, go for it. It's difficult. It is difficult. And I'll tell you why. Because for all the fact that we've got season tickets in the house at home now, I've lived in Huddersfield a long time. This has become my team over yeah. the years. I've still got to have a slight professional distance from it all. So professionally, you'll have to take my word for this, but a, a season where the drama is so blood curdling and we end up relegation fodder can be as professionally important as a, t as a season where yeah, we, we end up at Wembley and Chris Schindler's penalty gets us promoted to the Premier League. Mm. I've never, ever seen the kind of raw emotion that I saw that day at Wembley. In fact, we even described it on air, you know, people my dad's age behaving like six-year-olds, yeah. you know, grandmas in front of us behaving yeah. as if they were at Glastonbury, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and that really was happening around it's us. great vision, yeah. is that? Um, it's our job to describe it. Yeah. And we did so on air. But the day we got relegated by Birmingham City, Ooh, oh, uh, yeah. when Lou Macari had taken over from Steve yeah. Bruce, you know, the tears were just as, as yeah. apparent mm. for very different reasons. Yeah. The sheer 
catastrophe that ended at Port Vale when we got relegated. Yeah. Um, and I think that was relegation to League Two, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. that was five, um, five was one. Yeah, they threw it in style. Do you remember who scored that day? Martin. One of the worst players I think we've ever seen at Huddersfield. What for us? Yeah. Jason, Jason Gavin. Gavin yeah. <laughs> Jason Gavin scored with a corner. But professionally, corner. you see, all these things are as important as each other. We've still got a job to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually, when Christopher Schindler's penalty went in and all the other ones had gone in before that, it, it's such an acute level of concentration that you're supposed to be able to deliver. Yeah. I tried my best. Um, you did well. You sounded emotionally direct. You could tell that. I was. We were actually just talking you, yeah. about that before you got here. Now we all were. When it got to the end of that, and you were just yeah, almost you know falling my off. Thro- your, your, my throat had gone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my heart had nearly gone. Uh, I was ready United. to burst into tears. Like we're going to league. Liverpool. We're going yeah. to Man United. Yeah, yeah. knackered. <laughs> but professionally, it is just as important to depict the relegation moment as yeah. as the Premier yeah, League moment. Yeah. My heart, to answer your question, Matt, my heart would always say that that was the best moment I've experienced. Schindler's penalty. Mm. Yeah. As Huddersfield Town commentator, but honestly, professionally, there have been other ones just as important. Yeah, you know, uh, Fowler's penalty mm. that got us yeah. promotion at Cardiff. You see, that, that whole season for me was one of the most enjoyable in nearly forty years of watching Town. Oh, it was entertaining. That season was completely chaos. Yeah, it was you know, chaos. this is a season Upset. where we lost four nil at yeah. Macclesfield Town and still got promoted. I remember going to a pre-season game at. Uh, Wakefield and Emley when they when, when they used rugby ground and there were players on touchline as Jacko there and there were Tony Cars, Rob Edwards and a few players playing that night who were playing at their own risk because they weren't even actually signed by them but they're just committed to Jacko's selling of Huddersfield Town and mm. you could see then mm. you know getting that quality of players to commit without actually signing anything and put themselves at risk mm. you just knew that season were going to be different Peter Jackson's personality phenomenal drew players in yeah. he had some experience as an agent by then of he course did. if yeah. you remember yeah. he came back to us for a second managerial stint and what he did in between was immensely helpful it was a yeah. hidden piece of the jigsaw yeah. because he made so many contacts in places that he, he hadn't hitherto had contacts yeah. that it allowed us to build a squad but his charm his energy yeah. he'd be the first to admit that he, he wasn't the, the biggest master tactician mm. he left that to Terry Orrith and the yeah. team but That's why it worked. As, a, as a motivator yeah. That's exactly what we needed. Yeah, we're top notch. Mm, great guy, Jacko. Um, so going to back to 2016-18 in particular, mm. I think that moment, Schindler's penalty changed, David Wagner in particular, changed Huddersfield Town yeah. completely. Uh, we went from being that almost browbeaten football club who felt like it didn't belong in the second tier mm. of English football because everyone told us that, to one that could proudly rise above all of the nonsense and, and kind of say, we belong here and we're going further. Um in your opinion, how, what was the buzz like around the media in general, the wider media, uh, about Huddersfield Town during that period? Um, was it one of, what are they doing here, they don't belong here, or was it of excitement? I've seen some people, like Ian da- randomly, Ian Dark, quite happy for Huddersfield Town. I think he's a Pompey fan, maybe? Yeah. But he was quite happy for Huddersfield Town, you know, say famous old club, this is great. And then more of your new age ones going, oh, we don't want them in the Premier League, we want Nottingham <laughs> yeah. Forest or something. This is a big subject. This yeah. is a big subject. We could be here for, for ages, yeah. but we'll probably time box this the, to a couple of minutes. <laughs> what, one of the most interesting aspects of our experience in the Premier League, from the delivery of it to the end of it, was the perception of Huddersfield Town. Yeah. And what became apparent to me, once it became apparent to us that we were going to get in the Premier League, what became apparent to me is that there's a very, very big percentage of the UK media that doesn't watch anything except the Premier League itself. Mm. And a team that unexpectedly gets into the Premier League causes one thing amongst quite a lot of broadcasters and journalists. They don't like the status Panic. Yeah. I have no idea where Huddersfield is. Yeah. Who on earth are these players? And actually, to their shame, we all make mistakes, by the way. You know, we all have our flaws but to some people's shame they were still saying Chris Lowe yeah. and my favourite Skindler, Skindler at yeah. the end of our second Premier League season yeah it's pathetic to be honest it's, well it, you, I think, you can say that if you like Neil because yeah, it depends what you do for a living is one, it actually uh, your trade or not but uh, this is this is a there a, should be a bit more care though from for me a bit more so but what about professional credibility? Yeah, one thing that highlights that is that 
every other week on Sky Sports, Zanka was being dropped for Matthias Jorgensen. Yeah, there was, yeah, some shocking mistake. which <laughs> which was constantly on. yeah that kept us all going. And you know, I, I shouldn't start to throw stones at glass houses and all the rest of it. Everybody makes mistakes. I've told you about no, one yeah, of my yeah. biggest howlers, and that will continue because human yeah. beings, especially There's in live radio, between commentary. mistakes and ignorance as well. Though, yeah. Or actually bluffing your way through, you know, watching a football match yeah. that you're supposed to be covering. Yeah. Um, it's clear that Huddersfield Town was off most people's radar that cover the Premier League until Huddersfield Town got into it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, that really was the case. And, and respect to Ian Dark and all the other people who actually did know something about the place. But it's a place that you don't pass through except on the train maybe. Oh. You might not have a connection with it because we live in a, a, a strange location between Manchester and the Yorkshire conurbation. Um, and I think a lot of people came to Huddersfield literally for the first time yeah. because they'd been commissioned to cover a football match. So to answer your original question, Matt, in the wider media, there was a deafening silence when Huddersfield Town became promoted to the Premier League within a certain percentage of the wider media because nobody knew what to say. Yeah. You know, nobody knew, nobody had any anecdotes or any punditry to offer because they never had any experience of Huddersfield Town. Yeah, they'd have been a lot more comfortable with a Sheffield Wednesday or a Fulham, wouldn't they? For example, and even yeah. that would have been historic. Yeah. But the actual metamorphosis of the team under David Wagner from a struggling championship team to a, a team that won the penalty shootout in the playoff yeah. final, most people have just completely ignored it because, uh, and I detected some of this on the way, most people really thought, yeah, Huddersfield, they're pretty. Yeah, we like the German aspect of it. The fans don't half make a din. Yeah. We love all that, but they won't get through the playoffs. No. no chance. And hey, presto, we did. So there was a lot of scrambling and a little bit of bluffing, especially in the early days of our Premier League season. Well, we, we, we've mentioned a few that have sort of really embraced town being there. I mean, Henry, Henry Winter was yeah, Danny really Higginbottom pro town. Well. Dan, Danny yeah. Higginbottom, Higginbottom was brilliant. Correct. Very, very pro to field town. Well, he knows all about him because of Mark Lillis, because Mark Lillis yeah. had Higginbottom at Derby as a yeah. kid. And did a, did a, there's always connectivity in football somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. Henry Winter's, you know, he's one of the pioneers of his trade. Yeah, top notch. Yeah. Worthington. Still Worthington. Still trying to turn up for Makaliski. Back at a Rob Edwards! What we'll do is, we're, I'm aware of the time, so I'll, I'm going to do a couple of quick fire, a quick fire round, and we will make it quick fire this time, so you can say yes or That's no. That's your, your polite way of saying, Oggy, keep your answers short. <laughs> so, <coughs> we could talk to you all you can, you can obviously, you can say pass to any of these. One or two of these are from, from Twitter as well. So, yeah. number one, are you have, uh, sorry, are you or have you ever been a Burnley fan? No. Urban myth. We can put that rumour to bed. Number two. Sympathiser, yes, because of my granddad and my early career yeah. days that I've explained. But yeah. that is a classic Huddersfield town, urban, urban myth. myth. That's probably from the Radio Lancashire days. But number two, do you look up to any other commentators, past or present? Absolutely. <clears throat> past, and I did not like rugby union when I was a kid, Bill McLaren. Brilliant, yeah. Radio, Peter Jones. Ask your dad who this is, kids. Yeah. Um, uh, Peter Jones, definitely on the radio. Uh Test match special has been part of my yeah, yeah. Con consumption of sport since I was a little boy. Um, because of my connections overseas, I, I still idolise some overseas commentators. Um, you'd have to speak Flemish for this, but there's a, a fellow who covers the cycling in Belgium called Michel Vouts, uh, who I'm a big fan of still. And um, in the early days of covering rugby league, uh, Ray Warren. Okay. Ray Warren, a fantastic commentator. I think he still works for the Australian broadcast media. Number three, uh, from Reese Vivian on Twitter. Will you be doing Pedal for Pounds again? Oh, I hope so. Uh, I need no persuasion. I need no persuasion at all, Matt. Um, any ride of a bicycle is a good one. My mum pointed out to me recently that I've been riding my bike for 46 years now, which is very kind of her. Um, <laughs> so you're only 45 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with Pedal for Pounds is, is one of timing, yeah. and always has been, because they always do it in the week preceding the end of the regular football season, which in my trade, especially working for Look North yeah. as a camera operator and reporter, Money. is a bit like asking Marks and Spencer's sales staff to go on holiday two weeks before Christmas. Yeah. 
Um, it's the busiest time of our working year apart from Christmas. Um, and that's when Pedal for Pounds always happens. But the two I've done, uh, I really, really enjoyed them. I, I, need, I need no persuasion to get on my bike for a very long time. I remember seeing you all up down at Brighton at with Dean. On your to bike. the with Dean, with yeah. Dean. Okay, number four. Um, present incumbent notwithstanding, so we'll, we'll remove Matt Glennon. Who's your favourite co-commentator, analyst and pundit that you've worked with? Oh, I haven't worked with many, really, because we kept Kieran for so long and we've kept Matt, thank goodness, for so long. I, I, I can't answer that because they're all very different. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't swap Matt for the world. Sorry, though, I was that Kieran decided to go yeah. a different way. This is from Clark Eastwood uh, on Twitter. says, will you ever be attempting to interview in German again? I again? Don't, I don't know if there's an in-joke there. <laughs> uh, definitely. I need to earn a living somehow. Um, I, if needed, I, I can interview guys in German. My German's not as fluent as it used to be. Certainly not. But uh, sometimes it's sometimes needs must. I wonder if Clark's a relation to Chris Eastwood. There's a, an interesting question back for him. But favourite Huddersfield player, past or present? Oh, it's a tough one. Wow. Uh, Dean Gore, Marcus Stewart, yeah, Christopher Schindler for his efficiency. Oh, Matt Glennon was here. He'd strangle me and say, say Matt Glennon, say <laughs> Matt Glennon. Oh, uh, difficult best. off the top of my head, but definitely those yeah. those three. Uh, the Hayfuller for his character off the yeah. field. Yeah. Oh, there are loads. The, the best save Matt Glennon ever made at Huddersfield Town was not for Huddersfield, but for Carlisle. He made a triple save from Andy Booth. You can ask him about that one mm. next time. It was an absolutely... Nick Ovasson. <coughs> Brilliant save. Great keeper. Yeah. Your best overall moment at Huddersfield Town? Shenders penalty at Wembley. Okay, excellent. So that ends the quick fire round. So just the long ball forward, but he can't win that ball. He's going to chase the keeper down. He's charging it down. Yeah. And he's scored. Hayford has just scored for the most bizarre goal you'll ever see. The goalkeeper raced out of his area to clear the ball. Hayford charged it down. It's hit his back and it's bubbled in. And Town have got what they deserve. What, what ass- I've got a quiz. We've got a bit more if we've got enough time, but we'll see if we get get through this little quiz as well. So. Just for fun, I've got a quiz. Um, we, we, I think all Huddersfield Town fans, I, I don't really, we had a strange message on Twitter, but I, I, in terms of Huddersfield fans, we love the commentary. We proudly use clips of your commentary and segues from one thing to another, which I'm really pleased you haven't sued us for, which is great. Thank you to, <laughs> Why would I do to you and Johnny. And, jo- and Johnny, <laughs> Johnny didn't mention it, just lets it roll. Yeah, and carry great, on. Thank brilliant. you. Thank you, Radio Leeds. <laughs> Maybe we should start charging. <laughs> uh, can, can you guess which games these commentary moments are from if I read them with a deadpan voice oh brilliant go on some are, some are easier than others they, they get, they're genuinely quite easy and then they get a little last couple are a little harder but we'll, we'll go from here so number one Danny Ward saves Danny Ward saves uh, <laughs> Sheffield Wednesday uh, semi-final playoff penalty shootout yes <laughs> this is great <laughs> All three challenge stands. Forrest Jerry, Danny Ward saves! Danny Ward saves! And Town knock it forward. De Poitras forward. De Poitras got the better of the keeper. And Lauren De Poitras scores. Lauren De Poitras scores. Oh, was that Man United? No, I think that was the... Was that the, the Chelsea away game yes. where we won to secure our Premier League status? Yes, uh, De Poitras opening goal, or the only goal at Chelsea. Williams streaking across the halfway line, runs into Christopher Schindler and Town knock it forward. De Poitras oh. forward, De Poitras got the better yes! of the <laughs> And Laurent De Poitras scores! Laurent De Poitras scores! He bumped off the keeper. Number three, which I'm sure you will get. But they've given it straight to Moy again, who shoots. What a goal, Aaron Moy. An absolute thunderbolt delivered all the way from Australia. Not Wolves away. That was um, when we saw Town beat Leeds United at Ellen Road yes. in the promotion season. Three from three. But Leeds are getting it straight to Moy again who shoots. What a goal, Aaron Moy! An absolute thunderbolt delivered all the way from Australia. It gets it's, a little tri- I think you probably get this one. But. Listening to your own work is absolutely <laughs> terrifying, honestly. <laughs> There's fans who can't look at what's happening at the fantastic media end. (laughs) Moy with the penalty. It's saved. 
Kwana scores with the rebound. Oh. Colin Kwana following up the penalty, slides it in from a narrow angle. Yeah. Brain the moment, Colin Kwana. <laughs> Frame the moment, Colin Kwan. Is it is. frame? I, it sounds like brain. I thought it was brain. Preston, at home. Yes. Easter, very, very important win in yes. the promotion season. Yes, when we thought it'd all come apart. Yes. Especially when Aaron's penalty was saved. Who can't look at what's happening at the fantastic media stand down. Moy with the penalty. It's saved. Kwan scores with the rebound. Colin Kwan following up the penalty. Slide it in from a narrow angle. Bring the moment, Colin. Four from four, so we're, this one will make it halfway. Phil Billing intercepts, and then Derm feeds Billing's left foot down the left-hand side. This is a counter-attack of sorts. Derm's early ball into the box. Moyes shot. 1-0 Huddersfield Town. Aaron Moyes' first-time shot brings him his first goal of the season. Ooh. Now then, I'll have to think about this one, Matt. And I think I'll have to go for... No, it can't be the first Premier League season because we didn't have Eric Durham then. Mm -hmm. You've got me. You've stumped me on that. You've mentioned it already. Have I? Yes, with the Thunderbolt from Australia. Really? Yes. Pass. Wolves. Right. At Molyneux. Oh, Wolves at Molyneux. Yes. I hadn't visualised... No, you, you stumped me there. Well done. <laughs> I've, I've gone for like the earlier goals because usually people remember the winners, yeah. but I've cheated No, you, you got me there. Durham's early ball into the box. Moyes shot! 1-0 Huddersfield Town! Aaron Moyes' first time shot brings him his first goal of the season. Town pounce on Wolves' concession. What a strike by Town's Aussie! It really is Wolves nil. Huddersfield Town won at Molyneux. Number six. But the ball has run kindly for De Poitre, who releases Malone. <laughs> Malone squares it. Town are 30 yards out. Van La Parra shot. What a goal. What a goal by Raji Van La Parra. Would that be the West Bromwich Albion It match? is the West when Bromwich we beat Albion. West Brom, yes. Ended up with 10 men because Schindler got sent off. It Danny did. Williams playing as an improvised centre-half. Yes. Fantastic. Malone squares it, town of 30 yards out. Van the Parra shot! What a goal! What a goal by Rudgy Van the Parra! A right footed curler into the top corner! The town fans couldn't believe their eyes at first, but it's an absolute screamer from the Dutchman! Huddersfield Town 1, West from it shall be a nil! Number 7, and this is my favourite one, I'll be honest, apart from Schindler and Danny yeah. Ward. And all the others. <laughs> but this is one of my favourites. Number seven. Pressure. Payne gets there before the ball goes over the byline. Kachunga leaves it. Smith scores for Huddersfield Town. 3-2 Town. Kachunga left it and it's Tommy Smith the skipper who's drilled in one of the most important goals of the Huddersfield Town season. Rotherham United away. Correct. Valentine's Rotherham United Day. away in the promotion season. Valentine's Day with Oggy. <laughs> What a thought. <laughs> and if anybody's listening, that is the prize from this week now. <laughs> Ball goes over the bar like Kachunga leaves it. Smith scores for Huddersfield Town. 3 2 Town. Kachunga left it. And it's Tommy Smith, the skipper, who's drilled in. Surely one of the most important goals of the Huddersfield Town season. So, number eight. So, we're coming towards the end. Moy in space now. Ince arrives on the overlap. Here's Tom Ince. He cuts in field, then outside. Shot is blocked. Aaron Moy. 1-0 Huddersfield Town. 1-0 Huddersfield Town. Whoa. Moy. Ince. Hmm. Was that the Man United victory? It is. The first goal from the Man United game. Yeah. So you're on 7 out of 8. Aaron Moy pounces. Moy is on the ball and in space now, on the counter-attack. Ince arrives on the overlap. Here's Tom Ince, he cuts in field, then outside. He shots block. Aaron Moy! 1-0 Huddersfield Town! 1-0 Huddersfield Town against Manchester United! And whatever the outcome of this match, and of Huddersfield Town season as a whole, frame the moment, Town fans! Number nine, and the last two are a little bit tricky. I'm making no apologies. Hmm. And Town work it towards Rajiv Van Lepara, 
who's been allowed some space. He rolls it past X. Then the cross. Then the shot by Wells. Goal, Huddersfield Town. A slow motion shot by Naki Wells. Oh, yes. Newcastle United away. Yes, brilliant. Yeah, yeah it was it, a slow yeah. motion. And it, it really was. did feel like that. It did. It just rolled, didn't yeah. it? Yeah. It just rolled in. And the, the lack of animation behind the goal as we saw it. Yeah. I've got a, a mental picture in my mind of all these events that you're describing in text form. But the, the, the exasperation of the Newcastle fans behind the goal, yeah. no movement from them at all. Yeah. And for a, a tiny split second in your brain, human instinct tells you to review what you've just seen. You're thinking, did that really happen? Yeah. yeah. That's why I said slow motion in the commentary. Well, that was it a was, really important good, goal. Yeah. We, we were in a different county watching that game. Oh, we were in that Sunderland, flag, weren't we? It's awful. It's gone straight from Shelby to town, and town work it towards Raji van der Parra, who's been allowed some space. He rolls it past Shelby. Then the cross, then the shot by Wells. <laughs> goal, Huddersfield Town. A slow motion shot by Naki Wells, who scores on his first appearance of the season to silence in James's Park, except for one loud, proud section of Huddersfield Town fans. Newcastle United nil, Huddersfield Town one, and Town have scored in first half injury time. So the last one, wonderful juggling from Moy. Now Casey Palmer's on the dribble. 30 yards out, he looks at goal. Lazy tough, Tommy Smith's cross. Goal, Huddersfield Town at the far post. And it's gone in from Elias Kachunga's header. (sighs) Derby County promotion season. Kachunga scores some important goals. I almost included that one, but that was Harry Bunn who crossed that one. Right. No, you got me there. That was the first goal at Norwich on December in oh, December 2016 yeah. when we won 2-1 on Sky. As well. On the Friday night. On the Friday night. Now Casey Palmer's on the dribble. 30 yards out, he looked at goal, laid it off. Tommy Smith's cross. Goal, Huddersfield Town at the far post. And it's gone in from Elias Kachunga's header. That's it, 8 out of 10, that's a good effort. Not bad. We're not a good effort, so... That is the most terrifying professional moment I've ever been subjected to, listening to your own script. <laughs> <laughs> so we've only got a couple of minutes left. Brilliant for us, though. Um, yeah. Just with the last couple of minutes, Oggy, what, yeah. predi- you know, predicting the future. <gasps> um, we'll get your crystal crystal ball out. And I need a bloody good crystal ball for this one. <laughs> what are your feelings on, on the forthcoming season, the players we've brought in? Mm. Um, what should we be looking to achieve? What's reasonable? What's realistic? Mm. And do you think Town could bounce back or fall, or even fall through? There's an extreme of opinions between the sets of fans at the minute. I, I sit somewhere in the middle where just getting that winning feeling back mm. and, and working our way back would be great. But how do you feel? How there are feel quite a lot them? of people worried in town about us going all the way through, yeah. downwards. Um, and I'm certainly not that much of a pessimist. You use the word predict in your question, Matt, and this is, again, a a very personal bugbear. (laughs) If any of this that we're talking about, this glorious football team and all around it is predictable, I'll give it up right now (laughs) on your podcast. That is very true. Honestly, it's a piece of unpredictable sporting theatre. Yeah. My job would be a lot easier if it was predictable and it was predestined. It would be as much fun, though, wouldn't it? Well, I certainly don't think so. You can't predict these players. You can try and influence it, and that's what latterly Dean Hoyle um, and from now on Phil Hodgkinson and the team around him are going to try and do and credit to them for that I think we all appreciate Phil Hodgkinson's commitment and and the way he's going to take over from Dean Hoyle the continuity underpins our anticipation which is the word I would personally use instead of predict Matt that's fine Um, I anticipate a very at times difficult season because the championship's not a bad league yeah. It's got some very expensive and very talented players in it. It's very unfigured. So, at the other end of the, the the expectation scale, I don't expect us to breeze back up into the Premier League at all. No. We speak at a time when, actually, Huddersfield Town have brought four players in, latterly Bockhorn, um, which happened the day before we recorded this podcast. Um, and I think there will be more, but that's got to be underpinned by some players going out. Um, probably Zanka probably billing and maybe others if town receive offers that they can't refuse and the reason I'm going into this detail to answer your question is that the makeup of the squad is what's going to dictate how we do next season Um, 
Jan Ziva is very energetic. He's as committed as David Wagner was. Yeah. He manages in a different way. His tactical strategy will be different. But I think that the the thing that the board under Phil Hodgkinson and the management team on the training ground are all commonly, collectively trying to achieve is to make town entertain us and win matches again in its most basic form. We've become so used to watching town fail to win. Yeah. You know, even poor Jan Zivit himself, he was given a lot of under-motivated players. Yeah. Uh, he's had 15 matches and won one. Mm. Even legend David Wagner in the season chunk before that only won two. Yeah. Um, and the team has been uncompetitive for so long that what I expect to see as a fan and as a professional observer is a team that competes and entertains. I got, I got asked this question last week on uh, by Johnny. I did a bit of a phone-in and... Uh, my answer was very similar to the, how you've ended that, that we just want to be excited again and get off of seats again and no real aim of promotion, mid-term or whatever. That's sort of almost secondary to going back through turnstiles and competing and enjoying it again because yeah. that was completely <clears throat> lost in the last 12 months. The only enjoyment I think most of us got out of the, the second Premier League season in particular was was the you know the breathtaking skills of some of our opponents. Yeah. Uh, and one or two things that kept us going from a sense of humour point of view. Yeah. The cowshed loyals noise, yeah. the fans' reaction generally. There's always something to keep us interested at yeah. town, but on the field, the product just hasn't been engaging enough. No. Mm. We were glad it ended. We were really glad it ended. Mm. And we're not glad that the podcast has ended. So it's been a lot of fun, Oggy. Thank you so much for, for coming in. Um, it's been really great. Um, good luck for the forthcoming season at Radio Leeds to all at Radio Leeds um, providing Neil you've got no further no input just like to thank you for coming on it's uh, an honour to share the microphone with Mr Paul Ogden really well, enjoyed it thank you the I hope orator, it's not the last time the orator supreme us too you're welcome back at any time and frame the moment <laughs> not brain the moment <laughs> thank you very much Foggy hello I'm Paul Ogden and you're listening to And He Takes That Chance Releases Payne in space. Payne's got a chance. Yes. Payne scores. Jack Payne scores. Oh, boy's got options. Chunga plays it into the box. Well, 2-1 Huddersfield Town. Brighton just could not pick up Town's movement. Jackie Wells saw the chance and fired it into the far corner. Infield, he's got Moy. Boy can still hit one anyway. Deflection. Hagelhoff. 2 1 on a field down. Michael Hagel and the cult hero takes advantage of a deflection. Brain the moment on a field town because a German has won the West Yorkshire Derby. 4 3 challenge stands. For a sherry. Danny Ward saves. Danny Ward saves. German defender Christopher Schindler has unbearable responsibility on his shoulders. Right for it, Schindler! He scores the goal! The Flyers have a field into the Premier League. A switch quickly in field to Moy again, and Moy's looking in the penalty area. One, two, wicket jumper. Here's Moy, right for it! 1 0 Huddersfield Town! A goal of fabulous comp! Quality. Inch with a repeat corner from the right. Left footed, near post. Schindler flicks it. 1 0 on a field town. Twist of a Schindler has met Tom in this corner. It might have taken another deflection, but Town's talisman defender has broken and finished defence. The pass was in there. Here's Sanchez to turn it into the pass. Yeah. And Tommins scored. Tommins has scored one of the most important goals of Huddersfield Town's history. It's a big, big brick in the wall of Huddersfield Town's determination to stay in the Premier League. Williams speaking across the halfway line runs into Christopher Schindler and Town knock it forward. The flat has forward. The flat has got the better. Yeah! Of the and Laurent the Black has scored. Laurent the Black.